to discuss uh, the COVID-19 crisis in India and the controversy around the Central Vista project. I'm joined by a very special voice from the Indian government. Mr. Hardeep Singh Puri is the Indian Housing and Urban Affairs Minister and the Indian Civil Aviation Minister and he joins me for an exclusive chat from New Delhi. Sir, it's great to have you in the show. Thank you very much for your time. First up, sir, I do want to get your response uh, to the growing criticism around the Central Vista project. Couldn't this project have been postponed by a few months given the priority right now is managing the health risk? I don't uh, think I can subscribe to your uh, characterization of this as growing criticism. There is some criticism which was uh, there, which was misplaced because uh, some activists, uh, some people who are against development of any form uh, were trying to mislead the public. But uh, after we had the judgment of the Delhi High Court, uh, three days ago, which categorically said that this was not a public interest litigation. It was frivolous, that this is a uh, project of national importance, and the uh, petitioners were fined 100,000 rupees uh, by way of a punitive fine. So the criticism is not growing. I think some people who don't know anything about it are talking. There are two issues involved. One is that the Central Vista project in a, and of itself was approved in September 2019. That is way before uh, there was talk of COVID even in China, let alone anywhere else. Secondly, there are only two components in this which are being currently pursued. One is a new parliament building for which there has been a demand since 2012. And you know, the current parliament building uh, has in fact uh, uh, run into great difficulties. Even in 2012, when there was a Congress government here, the speaker, of the parliament wanted a new building and she had taken a decision to that effect. And next year we celebrate the 75th anniversary of India's independence and there is not enough space there. The parliament building uh, used to be in seismic zone two. Now it is in seismic zone four. God forbid if there's a tremor on the Richter scale, which is even uh, the slightly above normal, the building will have serious difficulties. Therefore, and you know, we have currently a freeze on the number of parliament members, but in 2026, that freeze will be lifted and we will go from 540 plus currently to 750. So there is absolutely no issue on the new parliament building. Some people have been trying to mislead, and I'm sorry to say some uh, news channels from outside, which like to depict India as, uh, you know, having a very serious problem on COVID, this, that, and the other. There's no binary relationship with the building of a new parliament, which only costs something like 840 crores and uh, the uh, Central Vista Avenue, which is another 400 crores. For vaccine, we've allocated a sum of 35,000 crore Indian rupees. We have ramped up production. We have two domestic manufacturers. Other international vaccine producers are going to be manufactured under license through commercial agreement. So there's just no correlation between the two. And let me also tell you, uh, we are the world's largest democracy. We are a robust democracy. Our uh, opposition parties are, if I may be permitted to use the term, uh, happy to indulge in irresponsible distortion of fact. And I think a few days ago, but I took a, uh, a press conference after the Delhi High Court judgment came, I pointed out that all the clearances had been obtained, statutory clearances, when the Supreme Court, which is the apex court in India, disposed of this matter in January 2021. After that, some people tried to ask for a cessation of work saying that since there's a pandemic going on and the court's findings, the verdict is very interesting. They said that the government has actually created a bubble there. They have got all the arrangements for thermal scanning. There are 1,600 people on this new project. On the parliament project, there are 1,300 people, 900 of whom, and we have already been vaccinated. So this is completely baseless criticism, which, but because we are a large democracy, um, some of the kind of things you can do in Singapore and other countries uh, to uh, haul up um, uh, this kind of irresponsible thing. Here, the court is only fined them 100,000 rupees by way of punitive charge. Uh, I am not sure whether this criticism will go away, but it certainly receded. And I think those who uh, were talking irresponsibly and now um, have some, uh, quest some questions to answer. Right, sir. 
There were reports doing the rounds that the number going into this entire project was two and a half billion dollars or 20,000 crores and critics as well as the opposition as you highlighted uh, are arguing that that money could have been spent towards COVID relief efforts. What's your take on that? First of all, I don't know where this figure has come from. I don't know what exchange rate you are using, but even the entire cost of the project, which has to be uh, uh, undertaken over a five or six year period, that entire cost of the project was not uh, more than 13,400 crores as given in initial estimate. And the real cost you find out only when you do the tendering and you get the competitive quotes on it. Second issue, the entire project consists of 10 massive buildings which will house the central secretariat. Just now, the government of India's 51 ministries and departments are strewn all over the city of Delhi. Those 51 departments will come in one place, 10 big buildings, a new conference center, a new Indira Gandhi Center for Performing Arts, a new residence for the vice president, new residence for the prime minister, all these things together along with the Central Vista Avenue, that is not going to cost 13,400 crores. Uh, and if it does, over a period of six years, Tanvi, do you know how much money we spend on paying rent for our government offices? We are a, a, a sovereign nation now. We have been an independent nation. Uh, we're going to be 75 years. And we spend 1,000 crores every year on paying rent uh, to um, uh, the private sector or the public sector undertaking because the government has not done it. So this is actually a very interesting project which will span over four or five years. Just now, only the new parliament building and the broadening of the Central Vista Avenue was taking place. But by the time I did, by the way, I did some hit, uh, uh, homework before I came on your show and I looked at when countries which became independent or acquired new governing independent countries like the United States, United Kingdom, South Korea, Philippines, Switzerland, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia uh, constructed their new parliament building. Sure. It was within a few years. Even Sri Lanka completed its building in 1982. We are in 2021. The current uh, parliament building, Tanvi, was conceived in 1920, which is 100 years ago. And it was never designed to be the bicameral legis legislature of an independent country. It was supposed to be the imperial legislature of the colonial uh, uh, power. So when we became an independent country, we should, this should have been addressed by the previous government on a war footing. But you know, that's how it is. They were busy doing other things. And now when the Modi government came in, we decided to take it up and we will get it done by the time we have the winter session of parliament next year. And it's all pre-COVID, number one. And number two, there's no relationship uh, on uh, expenditure for COVID. We've already earmarked 35,000 crores for the COVID uh, vaccine. And as my colleague, the finance minister, uh, is happily uh, 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 has happily gone on record. If more money is required for vaccine, it, it will, will be made available. And we'll come to that uh, in a bit, sir. I do want to uh, take up uh, the issue of vaccinations with you, uh, given that you're a key minister uh, in the Indian cabinet. Uh, the government has upped its uh, daily target of vaccinations uh, to roughly 10 million per day from the current run rate of 3 million. The INB minister, Mr. Prakash Javadekar, has said that by December this year, India would be fully vaccinated. I want to understand from you, how confident are you of achieving this goal given supply glitches? Uh, let me try and provide you, if I may, if I may be, on the overall state of the pandemic in India. India, as you know, uh, is a sui generis case. Uh, we are a large population with many developmental challenges. Our overall vaccination rate, uh, I don't have the figure readily available, is I think the third fastest in the world. Uh, we have been able to vaccinate people at a great speed. We initially thought that we would vaccinate only uh, what we call uh, uh, a certain limited population, 30 crore people by June. But suddenly, when the second wave came, there was a clamor for everybody to get vaccinated. Uh, we started with um, frontline workers, health workers, who were the most vulnerable section. Then we came to the senior citizens, people with 60 years of age and above. And then we enlarged that from 60, 45 to 60, and so on. But now we have decided, because of this uh, demand to in vaccinate everyone, I have the figure, both in terms of how many we've done, we've done over. Uh, uh, 21 crores 
22 crores uh, people have been vaccinated. Uh, the, we have paid the two existing domestic manufacturers, Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech, uh, advance money to produce vaccines for the whole of May, June, and July. We're already past May. And the amount which will be available from July onwards to August, September, October, November, December, those were the figures which actually would produce 213 additional crore additional vaccine, which is more than the population of India. But meanwhile, we are signing even with uh, other manufacturers. Uh, we are at a very advanced stage with some of the other uh, vaccine manufacturers. So your answer, short answer to your question is absolutely confident of being able to meet this target by December and way before that. Very heartening to hear that, sir. Sure, very heartening to hear that, sir, because that is the need of the hour. The government has also reportedly, uh, and as you have pointed out, spent nearly $5 billion on vaccinations. I want to understand how much more do you think will be needed uh, given the risk of a potential third wave and also booster shots in the future? You know, on my civil aviation part, Tanviji, whenever I'm asked a question, I like to preface it by saying, uh, depending on the behavior of the virus, uh, just now, what we have done is we have, in a very comprehensive and ambitious way, we've ramped up uh, the health uh, care uh, uh, infrastructure. I mean, the total number of beds, uh, the number of uh, the quantum of oxygen available for medical purposes, uh, other essential medicines like remdesivir and now uh, black fungus, etc. We, we are trying to procure as much vaccine. Yes, but what will be the third wave what will be the nature of that mutation etc now what happens in a situation like this that you produce an infrastructure you plan for it but what happened after the first wave because hospitals have increased the number of beds they hired more doctors and nurses and other health workers but when the demand was not there they cannot continue to pay them so the repurposing will always be a challenge when you are facing an enemy like the pandemic, the virus. Because if there is an anticipation, if we are sure. Now, I was looking at the figures in other countries. I mean, you know, some of our politicians uh, who are children studying in the UK, one of them tweeted, you know, my son went and got a vaccine done. It was totally seamless. Only yesterday I saw pictures of a stadium, Twickenham, where there were hundreds and thousands of people touching. We hear stories of highly advanced industrial democracies where there are, is a clamor for oxygen. And I, I know stories, I mean, I have relatives in New York. I've seen what happened uh, there at a point of time. So let's not berate anyone. It's a global pandemic. We have to fight it both at the local level, at the district level, at the state level, at the country level, and cooperate in a global effort. What we are doing is uniquely positioned now to deal with these challenges as they emerge. But you know, it would be very wrong of me to sit here and say we are fully prepared. Look, we've increased the oxygen supply, the number of beds, the number of medical workers, the medicines required, and the vaccines also. And if booster shots are, shots are required, madam, you know, in our country, I mean, you know a little bit about it, uh, there were people fueling vaccine hesitancy. They were deliberately going out of the way. So we have a problem in some rural areas, people say, well, if you get vaccinated, you may end up with, you know, a set of other problems. Well, that's a, uh, these are stories you hear in other countries also. But I think through proper dissemination and education, vaccination is necessary. Government is going about it. And, you know, just now two shots of the uh, 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 serum vaccine or one shot of the others which become available, we will play it um, as we go along, but we, we have reasonably confident that we have the situation under control. And I know, sir, this is not directly under your purview. This is not your ministry. But even so, uh, what can you get, tell us in terms of uh, what the situation is like on the ground, in terms of how much has the healthcare system ramped up with adequate medical supplies and oxygen supplies in the event of a serious third wave? Look, on oxygen, we had increased the oxygen supply, I think, what, two and a half times already. Now we have enough oxygen that we are diverting some of it back to industrial purposes. 
you know, in India, we also have a geographical issue. All the oxygen manufacturing plants are in the east of India. And the uh, transportation, it's a large country, so you have to transport them by rail or by surface transport, by uh, truck, by surface uh, roads to the north, central, and other parts of India. But I think we have it all mapped out now. If, if a third wave comes, and when it comes, depending on the requirements, our capacity to again repurpose and again to convert back to dealing with it, I think that infrastructural capacity is there. Before we wrap up, sir, um, and I know that you're aware of this, this has, of course, been a very sensitive issue uh, regarding India's uh, COVID-19 crisis in the second wave especially. The international community, as you're aware, has been critical of the Indian government for being complacent in managing the second wave with election rallies and the Kumbh Mela. What are your reflections on why the second wave got this bad when India had done so well in managing wave one? Well, I'm not entirely sure whether uh, the criticism when it comes. Well, first of all, like I said, all super spreader events, all super spreader events uh, should not take place, let me tell you. Some of these super spreader events take place because there is an inherent desire in people to uh, want to celebrate. You know, when the clampdown took place in New York for the first time, I remember people came out and protest. It also led to uh, looting, uh, including on Fifth Avenue because people don't like to be bottled down. So one is an individual behavioral thing, and I think the Prime Minister of India has been upfront in every meeting with chief ministers. I remember at meeting with chief ministers, which he took on 16th March, Tanviji, he said, second wave is coming, second wave is coming, second wave is coming, get prepared. And yet, and yet, because we, unless you know, water is beginning to enter your nostrils, people didn't take that seriously. But in any case, I think the message has been driven home. Some of these super spreader events that you are referring to are of a religious kind. Religious kind where, you know, people collect for a mela or there is a, a cleric who passes away and, uh, you know, people go in a funeral procession. That's different. Insofar as politics, when the wave figures hit, I think they cancel the election rally. You can always have an argument, can, whether it should have been cancelled one or two days earlier or... Uh, you know, it doesn't make a difference. But by the way, the political rallies were taking place in a state. That state is not showing uh, 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 those high figures. On the other hand, the opposition was actively fueling a farm protest on the border of Delhi in the state of Punjab and Haryana. And uh, on the one hand, these people are saying, you please don't have these super spreader events. At the same time, at the same time, they are encouraging these hardworking, very genuine farmers, many of them who really toil on the soil. But what did the government do? We ensured that the maximum amount of procurement took place, both for paddy, rice, and wheat. Uh, you know, all this talk about minimum support price going away Monday. I mean, it's, there have been record pro, uh, uh, procurement in Punjab and Yana. But some people have been misled, and they sat on those protests. Now, if there's a spread there. So, you know, governance in a country of India's size and with India's challenges uh, is a slightly more difficult thing than in smaller population with a, which have all also higher degrees of, you know, 100% education. We have 100% education in some parts of India, but people are more emotional and they tend to uh, respond to, uh, you know, their own needs. No, and, and you have a point, sir, that this pandemic has not come with a playbook for any government, any administrative body, any community, and everyone has made their share of mistakes. I think why uh, the disappointment with India is because, A, India had done a very good job with the first wave, and so the expectation was high and the confidence was there that it could be repeated with the second wave. And given the emotional toll the second wave has had on lives, on people, you know, the anguish, the pain, the anger there. Uh, I guess the, the larger issue, the bigger question is, could this have been averted or could this have been mitigated, so to speak, uh, by avoiding some of these events? I have a very simple answer for you, Tanvi. When it comes to something which is, I think, where the virus is the enemy, and this is a once-in-a-century challenge, I think judgment on how countries uh, affair uh, should be done over an extended period of time. We came out with flying colors after the first wave. 
if you were having this conversation with me two weeks earlier, you might have a different. Now I can tell you with confidence, India's recovery rate today is very high. It is over 90% uh, the recovery rate. The mortality rate is also very low. I think it's what 1.2% uh, in Delhi and a slightly higher mortality rate. Now, I don't want to belittle the fact, that as far as I'm concerned, one death is one death too many. But the criticism is you have to compare like products. You know, produce is similar. You don't, you don't go and compare a country with India side. But as I said, the discourse even here has changed. Today, I think people can say with confidence, you know, I used to get 100 calls uh, every day for uh, health, so oxygen cylinders, uh, people wanting essential medicine, because you know when things go wrong, but that's the same that happens everywhere else, in the United Kingdom, in Japan, and elsewhere. But the situation now, both in terms of infrastructure uh, revamping, First wave we did very well, second wave because in spite of all the modeling we had got done in uh, U US universities elsewhere, nobody expected a spike as serious as 400,000 cases plus in a day. We didn't expect it. We prepared. When the when the cases were going up, we got an American university professor of Indian origin to do the modeling and she said it probably will go up to 100,000 when it was almost low when we saw the beginning. We prepared for 300,000. But then when the spike took place, it went way beyond. I think one of the figures was 425,000 in a day. So we learn. Now I know of hospitals who tell me, you know, we've ramped up the infrastructure. We've got all these beds. What do we do? We can't maintain the expenditure. See, I think we've, to the extent that, um, you know, it's learning experience. But I think by the time the third wave comes, I hope uh, we are all equally well prepared for it. And also our uh, experience in terms of lockdown. You know, the first wave came, we locked down just totally. So we, the first quarter of the last financial year, can we be contracted by 23.9%. Now in our last quarter, uh, for which we just got the result, the economy actually grew by 1.4%. So these are experiences that we learn. But let's just hope that we um, get a handle on the virus, both uh, globally and in uh, uh, countries like ours, where you live and I, where I live, and that when the time comes for the third wave, we'll be fully prepared for it. And we wish you the very best with your efforts, sir. Thank you very much for patiently answering all our questions. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.